evening, everybody, and welcome to Matrix TV. And the dumbing down of America stops here. Coming up in a few minutes is first-time guest Ron Garner. Ron is a documentary filmmaker and co-owner of the original UFO Enigma Museum in Roswell, New Mexico. You know, a recent poll shows that a majority of the American people believe that they have been deceived by their own government in the best-kept secret of all time, tangible proof of the existence of life forms from other parts of the universe visiting Earth and carrying out operations beyond our control. The big questions are, was this deception legitimate, and why has it continued for so long? Esteemed government scientist Daniel Burrish, Ph.D., maintains that he has been in the forefront of interacting directly with one of these beings. As a microbiologist at the super-secret S4 facility inside Area 51 in Nevada, he was ordered to take hundreds of tissue and DNA samples from a live EB. By the way, EB is short for extraterrestrial biological entity in order to diagnose and treat a neuropathy that left the being greatly weakened. And tonight's first-time guest, Ron Garner, is helping Dan reveal what he knows about those secrets. This is not an X-Files story. It's an amazing true story destined for the history books. Going to be good. So here in the first of many clips tonight of an interview in preparation for disclosure, let's meet Dr. Dan Burrish. Initially, I was briefed that J-Rod was an alien, uh, specifically from the reticulum system to reticulum 4. Okay. Uh, I had no idea the truth, yes, from 2 reticulum 4 now, but I had no idea the truth of how they came to be. Um, as I said to you before, I have never met an alien, but I have met an extraterrestrial. Ron Garner has been a UFO and paranormal researcher for over 30 years and is the co-owner of the original UFO Enigma Museum in Roswell, New Mexico. I think we've been there. We He's have. written three books and numerous articles about the Dan Burr story and joins us tonight to help us understand what could be one of the most important revelations ever to come out of secret government research at Area 51. Welcome, Ron. Hello, Kate and Richard. Uh, glad to be with you this evening. Thank you. Hello. Now, listen, in that first clip we just aired, Dan says he's never met an alien, but he has met an extraterrestrial. What is the difference? Well, the difference, and this is the key to understanding this whole field, is that these beings are able to travel in time. When we see all these UFOs flying around, they're actually flying time machines. So this being, this uh, code name J-Rod, his personal name is Kala, with a hard K, uh, is from the Zeta Reticuli star system. And from what Dan has told me and what other people that I've researched, that this person is a future human. So the genome of the J-Rod, which I have uh, detailed on my website, uh, that we... He is a very similar to normal humans present today. Now, an alien, on the other hand, is would be someone or some being from another star system that had no linkage to the human race. And one example, I don't know if I gave it to you or not, is the Virginia case in Brazil that I visited four years ago with Roger Lear. Now, that was a true alien. And my plan is to get the genome of that uh, being in Brazil and compare it to the J-Rod, and that's on my high on my agenda. For now we we have a pic we uh, Ron we have a picture of that Brazilian one. That's the one with the reddish eyes as opposed to the the black eyes. That's reddish eyes. I, I have a question for you though. You know, I mean, Dr. Dan Burrish has come out and said all this uh, this uh, stuff about his involvement with this EB. I mean, it's a wonder this guy hasn't been taken out or killed. I know. That's what my concern was in the beginning. Uh, I had my car broken into three times and uh, tape stolen and so forth. But uh, when it started leaking out, there's just too many people that knew about it. So my information is that the Majestic Organization took a vote in April of 05. It was six to five for disclosure. In September of 05, it was eight to three for disclosure. So Majestic is behind this, reluctantly, I admit, but they want this out. And uh, for whatever reason, Dan Burrish, Crane, 
that's his, his given name at birth, yeah. is the poster boy for a disclosure and put other strange reason. I'm the media person that's supposed to make it happen. So right. Ron, this is can, a scoop on everybody to, to both of you tonight. All right, cool. listen, we've only got two and a half minutes before our first break, but let's backtrack a little bit for our viewers and tell people who, who this alien or a guy, this extraterrestrial was. How did, how did Dan Burge get, get, to, a hold of him. <laughs> get a hold of him? How did Area 51 get a hold of this uh, E.T.? He crashed in uh, Arizona, near Kingman, Arizona, in 1953. There were four beings on the ship, and three of them were taken to Los Alamos, and this J-Rod was taken to Area 51. And as a journalist, which is what I consider myself, I have to have at least two or three sources. So I have three sources on this. I have Bill Uhouse, who was working at Los Alamos building a... Um, a device to uh, teach our pilots how to fly these vehicles called the ARV, Alien Reproduction Vehicle. I've interviewed him and his family in depth, and he said that we have these, be that, that, this, that the three were taken to Los Alamos and one was taken to uh, Area 51. They had to take it to a back road across a, a bridge because the, the UFO w could not be tipped, so they had to put it on a flatbed truck and sh and take it across the Colorado River the so it, way into Area 51. Okay, so it went into uh, to Area 51 now. How long how, ago was this? How how so did 1953? 1953. How did Dan get involved in this though? Well, he was brought into it uh, formally in 1991. They were testing him and teaching him microbiology because they identified him uh, when he was just a child. Now, this is a big part of the story that most people don't understand is that the ET people, because they are time travelers, they can see the past and the future. Now, they have a device that they've given us that our military right now is using right now in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is my personal opinion, but it's very well informed. They can see with this device, it's called the Yellow Book, they can see the past and the future. So they can see that this young man... I met Dan when he was only 38 years, 38 years old, eight years ago, and they recognized that he had the talent because he was abducted, taken aboard the ship when he was nine years old, uh, right here in Southern California near Whittier in Lakewood. He was taken on board the ship, and the J-Rod that he was eventually going to meet 20-some years later was on board the ship when he was taken uh, from that a ballpark when he was playing ball with his grandfather. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So that they knew back then that because they were in the future. Amazing. We're going to have to take a break, Ron. When we come back, we have another clip and we'll learn what was wrong with this poor J-Rod. We'll be right back. We had regular, systematic uh, medicals by a physician. Um, following that, we would be suited, well, we would be catheterized, plugged, uh, and suited. Um, communication apparatus was placed on our heads. We had a cooling system set up. It was, for all uh, intents and purposes, it was a space suit. It was a total encapsulated suit, something like what you would find uh, in a NASA facility. Uh, we were suited up, we were pressurized, uh, and then walked with our cooling system and our hosing down a ramp into the ambassadorial suite. Uh, he was held actually below the ambassadorial suite level, and that was raised up uh, as needed. What they did with him down there, he didn't say, and they didn't tell me. It was not a need to know issue. Apparently, they dealt with the cleaning of the, of the sphere and all of that down there. The regular housed animal maintenance as they treated him. Okay, we're on the phone with Ron Garner. And uh, listen, Ron, it sounds pretty complicated. We just aired that clip of Dan's talking about how they had to be so careful when they met with the J-Rod. Uh, what other protocols were involved in there? How about communication? How did they speak to each other? Yeah. It was all through telepathy, and that was a key point of why they allowed Dan to be the lead microbiologist at Area 51. 
he was moved into that place when he was junior in years and in and in seniority working with the the secret government. So uh, because he had this telepathic connection with the J-Rod from when he was abducted when he was nine years old. So they would debrief him after he talked to the J-Rod, and he wouldn't always tell him everything that J-Rod told him. Right. And that's a whole another story in itself. Hey, Ron, do, do it was you, all through telepathy. Do you know uh, Dan Sherman by any chance? I've uh, read his material, yes. Yeah, he, well, he was on our show probably nine years yeah, ago, yeah. and he said the same thing, that he was locked up in a room, and uh, he was able to communicate telepathically with a being. And he only told his superiors half of what the, uh, the being That's told right. him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you... I know. Dad, Dad said the same thing. Right. So the, now, who all was in, involved in this? You say Majestic 12, but who's this? Uh, there's this Mike McConnell. What does he have to do with it? Well, this is a scoop for your show. Nobody knows this, but McConnell was formerly head of Majestic 12 until uh, 06 or 05. And he's the reason, in my informed opinion, that Dan Burris is alive, because these other over 40 microbiologists have met untimely deaths, but Dan Burris, Crane, is alive because of McConnell. That's McConnell right. was like his godfather, and he was director of national intelligence for President Bush and left office then. And I have an actual letter from him. It's not signed. I know Stanton Freeman would be upset because it's not signed, but I know that it's from him where he explains why Dan was chosen, why Bob Lazar was chosen, why all this happened in 1989. So uh, this is a scoop for you guys. I won't tell who the other 11 are. That will come later. Thank you. But at some point we need to approach uh, Admiral McConnell and ask him. He may not respond, but I think he will. Well, Ron... Because this, Dan Burrish may be Dan Burrish may be alive and is alive today, but there are, have been dozens and dozens of other microbiologists yeah. who have disappeared mysteriously. That's that's a fact. Or died, or absolutely. Died. Uh huh. So you think that this Mike McConnell is the reason Dan's still kicking? But what about the others of this majestic twelve? You said that it was a, a five to three vote in September of uh, some time, some year recently. April of '05. April yeah. of '05. So. And for, no, for whatever reason, uh, when they vote, it's, there's always one abstention. So the first vote was 6 to 5 for disclosure, and in September of 05, it was 8 to 3. It has something to do with the protocols of the Freemasons. Oh, uh, what? That's a whole other discussion, but uh, there's one that, that, that doesn't vote. Protocols so, of the no, Freemasons. They, they want this out, and I know who they all are. I can out them at the right time. Uh -huh. And you will be amazed. They're all, almost all of them, they're... they're Familiar names, you know everybody as a part of Majestic. Okay, so now we during the break we were just briefly talking about this whole idea of of the television series V. Right. It, do you think that's another way of getting this information out? Yes, I do. Unfortunately, they they use fear. That's part of what uh, the controlling uh, groups want to do is make people fearful. Uh, I think about eighty percent of the extraterrestrials are just fine and they're here to help us. There's maybe 15, 20 percent that are not so good, but they're not so evil as depicted in V last night. Yeah, that's a so, terrible, uh, scary uh, concept that they have there. And they get into vaccines and everything else there. Do you well, think... Well, the thing is, but, but, but maybe there's another kind of extraterrestrial roaming around, Ron, not, not the, yeah, uh, the good right. guys. Yeah, I think there is. And I want to put this in here right now because this is really important. Um, the, uh, Cam the James Cameron movie is the Stan Burry story in reverse. The J-Rod and his fellow brothers came here to help us, where in Avatar, we went there to affect them. So at some point, I want to get this information to James Cameron because uh, for whatever reason, he's been inspired to do this wonderful movie, Avatar, which I think is just a wonderful right. movie. Oh, yes. Well, it's listen, we, uh... this, is a, this is directly opposite of that. They've come here, and I can prove it. I have documentation. Uh -huh. 
Well, you know, Ron, we uh, we we're on the air here in Los Angeles, so maybe, uh, maybe he's watching tonight. <laughs> okay. Now, listen. Uh, when we we're going to have to take for a break, but when we come back, you do have many people who can co independently corroborate uh, Dan Burrish's story, and we have a clip from Bob Lazar coming up, and why the J Rod sacrifice to come back here and submit to these terrible tests. We'll be right back with Ron Garner. It's a sloped building that's up, butt up against the side of a mountain. The hangar doors on the outside have sand on them, like it was glued on, and it's just a texture. And I don't know if that's to prevent satellite photographs, uh, anyone from guessing what it is. But it, it, uh, when I got out of the bus, I ran my hand on it, and I said, boy, this is really weird. And the uh, hangar doors are diagonal, about a 45-degree slope, and they open like that. It looked, it looked really neat. It looked like something in a James Bond set. But, I mean, this is a... How would you describe the complex? Uh, large, elaborate? Fairly large. I don't think I was, uh, I was through more than 25% of it, really. You didn't get to see very much? They kept you in one kind of area? Yeah. How many people did you work with? I mean, how many people might have been doing the same thing as you? I couldn't even guess. I knew two, three, four people, that's about it. You said it's very compartmentalized. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how how many people might have had the big picture, or who? I don't know if anybody had the big picture. All right, uh, we're back. Uh, this is the DVD, Alien Disclosure at Area 51, produced by our guest, uh, Ron Garner. Ron, this Bob Lazar that we just aired a clip from him, who is he for the people who don't know? Well, Bob Lazar is key to uh, this story in many ways. Uh, he was a physicist, and he was recruited to work at Area 51 in 1988 and uh, my information was that the secret government was going to bring out this information in the 80s. Uh, Linda Howe is a good friend of mine and she was contacted by uh, Air Force Intelligence and was told in 1983 that she could do a documentary and they would supply footage and she had contracts pending with HBO so this was supposed to come out and uh, it, it's a long story why it, it's been delayed this long, but uh, McConnell, in his letter to me, says that they tried Bob Lazar, and they felt that he was a uh, kind, of, kind of person that, that they would test. They didn't know for sure if he could keep quiet or not. And uh, uh, at the same time, they were recruiting Dan Burrish. So uh, at that time, this is 89-90 time frame. So uh, Dan Burrys did what Majestic told him, but Bob Lazar sort of went off the reservation. Mm -hmm. Right. So they had to t take him out. But he he actually was there. He worked on the on the alien reproduction vehicles and the other craft that were at Area 51. There were nine hangars, and he hang, hung upside down in in one of them and saw the reactors that was the motivating force, mm -hmm. and it it changes gravity. And that's a big part of this whole story is anti-gravity. Right. Ron, and where I is Bob Lazar? Where is Bob Lazar today? Any idea? Uh, he, moved, he moved to Michigan about uh, nine months ago. He had he a was story. In Mexico. When he uh, first he started was, at when he first started at the S four facility, he was walking by what he thought to be a an alien spacecraft, and and when somebody wasn't looking, he stuck his hand through the skin of the craft. Is that a true story? Or, 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 I've never heard that part, but I can okay. tell you another <laughs> interesting story. It's in, in one of my videos. I interviewed uh, John Lear about this. And by the way, John Lear totally supports the Dan Burrish crane story 100% because it dovetails with what he knows about Bob Lazar. And uh, John Lear told me that Bob Lazar took a small camera, uh, one of his little tiny cameras, in there to take a picture. Of in there to prove what that he was there, and uh, he slipped it into the leg of a chair, and then never went back to get it. <laughs> but uh, this is a big part of the story. Lazar was only there for three and a half months. Dan Burry's crane worked there on and off for over ten years, so it's a big difference there. Sure. But uh, John Lear, who I trust totally with this story, 
says that Lazar was there. He was there, and I can go into great detail about Bob Lazar. And uh, but Bob Lazar and Dan Burris have never met. On my long list of things to do, I want them to get together. And because they will support each other. Right, yeah. because right. Because they both saw the same thing. Now, the clip we aired was from an interview that uh, George Knapp from uh, Las Vegas's KLAS, the, he did an interview. And, and it seems that George pretty well supported and, and got behind Bob's story. But for some reason, there's a difference with the Dan Burrish story. How, what's that? Well, I can tell you what happened there. That was, goes back to what I was saying when uh, Dan Crane at that time organized what they call Horizon 90 in Las Vegas and even had Carl Sagan come because Carl Sagan was a part of Majestic, not the, the formal Majestic, but some of the subset of Majestic. And when Dan organized this, he was there and the story about Bob Lazar had come out, but uh, the Dan Crane story had not come out. So uh, someone on the inside leaked the information to George Knapp that uh, Dan Crane had the same experience as Bob Lazar. So when George Knapp came to that meeting, he, had, he met Dan in the hallway or something and asked him, and then Dan was evasive and told a little fib, and, well, I didn't, and so on and so forth. So that put George uh, Knapp, got it. Uh, you know, bent him out of shape, rubbed him the wrong way. <laughs> so, right. that, and, so now there's a Dan, difference Dan forever. Crane's ex-wife made some nasty things. About, said some nasty things about George on the internet and went oh, downhill from there. Got it. Got Ron, we have I to, talked to we, George. We have to take a yeah, break, Yeah, George Ron. has been a guest on this show and a great guy. We need to get to a commercial break. Here's the DVD, Alien Disclosure, at Area 51. Our guest is Ron Garner. Uh, why don't we come back? More from the super secret installation at Area 51 and why the extraterrestrial was so sad. Welcome back to Matrix TV. There's still so much more to come with documentary filmmaker Ron Garner, co-owner of the original UFO Enigma Museum in Roswell, New Mexico. Yep, and uh, we're going to continue with the story of how one government microbiologist was interacting on a daily basis with an extraterrestrial being for over two years at the super secret S4 facility inside Area 51. And we're back with Ron after this very revealing video. He was hunched over most of the time, could not support himself fully uh, given muscular atrophy. And that had to do with the, the, uh, the peripheral neuropathy under which he was suffering. Um, so he would grunt and move toward me almost in a flopping fashion. Uh, feet were, were large in comparison to what we would uh, you know, say our feet would be. Um, how many toes? He was unclothed four. Four. Yeah, he was, uh, he was uh, unclothed, um, which bothered him. Um, he wanted to wear clothing, called himself, called himself captive, and uh, justifiably so. So, Ron, why was the alien, not the alien, the extraterrestrial J-Rod so sad? Well, he was sad because he missed his uh, wife and family, his mother-in-law and his child that was back on Zeta Reticuli. Well, now, there's something you just and don't think about. Really? Yeah. He was sad because he, was, he missed his family, as we would be. Sure, we would, too, of course. And he was sick. And what exactly was wrong with him? Uh, Dan says something about a neuropathy. Uh, what, what, what exactly was yeah, going on? Yeah, neuropathy, the disease. It's very a painful disease. A friend of mine has had it and told me how painful it is. And uh, what this, part of this story, and this is, gets a little arcane, but I'll, I'll try and do it briefly, is that uh, when they make an adjustment, coming back here and make an adjustment, in this case to the genome, then that helps heal us in the future. Because if, if this had been healed, then in a different timeline, then we will not get this disease in the future. Right. So in a sense, the J-Rod is a sacrificial lamb. He came here voluntarily to uh, have this genome change. Now, Danny and his microbiologist friends did not completely heal it, but they did heal it uh, somewhat. So that will affect the timeline. 
That is so bizarre to me. It's one of those things That's where you really just, bizarre. when you go back in time, and if you do uh, affect so that, though, what else can, are you messing with, you know? Well, that's what Danny he calls it, and it's a formal name, Convergent Timeline Paradox. Well, you know, we're talking here on the phone now in March of 2010, but there's another part of us that's in another um, parallel universe. So uh, I know this is hard to understand, but on Coast to Coast uh, last month, this Anderson Institute, uh, your, your listeners or viewers should check that out in New Mexico, mm-hmm. has a device which is very similar to what I mentioned earlier in this interview, that you can go there and you can uh, see the future and the past. You can dial the future and the past right now if you go to the Anderson Institute in northern New Mexico. Wow. So, Ron, are, do, do, you, do you believe that we are uh, in parallel universes? Do you think they really exist? Absolutely. I do, too. That, that's, what, that's what a deja vu experience is. If you've ever experienced Many deja times. vu, that's a time slip. Yes. And you're seeing something that just happened or that will happen. It can go either way. So I wonder if we, in fact, are living ourselves in another parallel universe. Yeah, sure we are. I think that's a strong possibility, yes, that there, we have multiple selves. And uh, uh, another thing that, that happens that most people hear about, especially on Coast to Coast and paranormal things, um, George Knapp, Skinwalker Ranch, if Reese. you know about that story. Yeah, we I'm had sure him on the not. show. Uh-huh. So he was talking about how these beings were coming and going. They had cameras. Whenever they would focus the camera in a certain direction, then the, whatever the paranormal event would be on the opposite side of the camera. So they had consciousness. Sure. And you have the Mothman prophecies. You have Bigfoot. You have all these other beings and, and uh, uh, that from the other dimensions that slip over from time to time. That's why they can never actually get a hold of one. Right. Brad Steiger is a good friend of mine. He's written many books yes. about this. So yeah, I, we had Brad on the show a long yeah. time ago. Now, we, there, we well, have a picture. First of all, I, okay, you go ahead. Kate. We have a, a sketch here of the J-Rod, and it looks like he's, uh, it looks like he's attacking um, Dan, but that wasn't really what happened. What was going on there? Yeah, what was happening, Dan had been visiting the J-Rod, taking these tissue samples for two years, 94 and 95. At the end of 95, for the first time in two years, the J-Rod, in kind of a joke, made a move toward Danny in his totally encapsulated suit. This surprised Danny. He stepped back, caught his heel, and fell back on his backpack. And the J-Rod sort of loped over there and crawled. He didn't jump on him. He crawled up on his chest, looked deeply into his eyes, and downloaded all of this information into him, Holy which God. is what I have 100 hours of a video of him explaining all this information that the J-Rod downloaded into him. What kind of information so it was are we talking about? Thing, but then he had two modes of communication. One was to the security and one was to the scientist. So he was saying no, no, no to the scientists because they could ramp up the pressure in the clean sphere and hurt the J-Rod. Oh, no. But they thought he was saying no, no, no to the J-Rod. So oh. they had to get the other people suited up. It took them a half an hour to get suited up the other microbiologists to get in and drag Dan out. So you said that and the J Rod was for about the twenty four hours after that. Ron, you said that the J Rod was downloading information to, to Dan Burrish. Did did we ever know what kind of information or what the information was? Yes, he wrote a whole book about it. About Mars and that's that's where we're going to Mars. I know Obama doesn't want to, but we're going there, whatever Obama says, and we're gonna have set up colonies on Mars. And so Dan wrote a whole book about it in 1996, Shoot. and that's why he was censured for his uh, Ph.D. He got his Ph.D. in SUNY, New York, and people that I know called there and said, yes, he graduated. Yeah. But when he uh, published this book that the Majestic didn't like, they had his, um, his Ph.D. erased from SUNY. But I have other documentation that proves that he does have a Ph.D. Wow. All right, Ron, stand by with us. Uh, our guest tonight is Ron Garner. When we come back, more corroboration about the super secret installations throughout the United States. Be right back. If everybody here has seen... Um, Bob Lazar's poster, that's the closest thing you'll see until you see the real one <laughs> of a flying disc. Anyway, there's, a, there's also some question on grays. 
And you notice, you know, I see all these <clears throat> various different suits and all that. They wore a shirt and a pair of pants. Their shoes were a little different, but then I just did this about three weeks ago. This guy's name is J-Rod. Imagine that, J-A-R-O-D. That's a translation for whatever, you know, they had given the translators at the facility that I worked at. Uh, there's a lot of linguists, there's, uh, there's so many people involved in this whole particular project, it's just insurmountable. The, one of the things I wanted to say and bring out that the reason why you, everybody talks about the government's not going to do this, the government's not going to do that. Well, let me tell you guys something. That's the government you know. There are, there are little countries in this country. You got one not so far from here. Uh, they, they, uh, it's, it's part of Area 51, but that, a portion of that facility is a separate country. And that is not the government. That's a separate entity in its own. Okay, we're back with Ron. Listen, uh, we just heard this clip from this Bill U House, and you mentioned him earlier on in the interview, but what did he do? What did he exactly do? Uh, was he at Area 51 or only in New Mexico? Oh, no, he was at Area 51. Oh. And I'd interviewed his son, Will Uhouse, for four hours. And uh, Bill just passed away May of last year. And uh, I'm told that his son got some a cache of information from his father that he will share at the right time. Well, Bill Uhouse, I first met him at a conference, UFO conference in Las Vegas in 93. And then other people that I know interviewed him. I have about uh, three or four hours a video and audio of him. You played some of it there. Mm -hmm. But he was uh, a Marine pilot in World War II, and he worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and then they recruited him and they wanted us to, get to uh, work with the Actually, yeah. extraterrestrial people. And he tells in my video how, and this is just pure logic, that he was tested to see if he could deal with working with extraterrestrial people. A lot of people can't. And that's another big story that ufology doesn't understand, that the, uh, one of the reasons for disclosure is the E-tier people are fed up with talking to second- and third-tier people. The really sharp scientists, Dan's an, ex an exception, but the really sharp scientists are not going to work in those conditions of secrecy. Yeah. And no matter how much they get paid, so... Uh, Bill Uhouse, they tested him, and he, he passed the test with flying colors. He says it on my video. So he was able to work with the extraterrestrial. And the extraterrestrial was an engineer. He was, mm -hmm. when they were building uh, the simulator to teach our pilots how to fly the UFOs, Bill Uhouse would ask the ET scientist, where does this go? What's the oh. calculation? And they, an ET person, the engineer ET person, would say, no, do it this way and do it that way. Amazing. And, that is just too incredible. So, so um, the, the, what, Bill's, what really got me about Bill's clip was that he says there are separate countries yeah, this is fascinating. within the country. What does that mean? You mean within our country? Well, in our country, at the Area 51. It's a separate country. It's just like an Indian reservation. Oh, okay. Uh, they don't go by our laws. That's why the president can't go there. Uh, that's why in the movie Independence Day, when yes. they, I don't know if you knew the backstory on Independence Day, when they first talked to the military and Air Force about doing, oh, yeah, we'll help you. But when they said they are going to have Area 51, <laughs> uh, the Army cut everything, so they, the people that made Independence Day had to... Uh, use uh, National Guard troops instead of the Army. They wouldn't cooperate because that's uh, super secret, Area 51. That's why my site, Area 51 Disclosure, is so important because I'm going to explore all these things that nobody knows right. about. So you're saying that Area I'm 51... I'm still here and still standing, and uh, you guys will know a lot more than anybody else. Ron, so you're saying that Area 51 is a separate country? Within the United States, part that's of it is. Part of it is, and that's why part, they can get away with. Is, right. they can, that's why they can get away with burning, burning waste and and doing <laughs> testing. That's probably why. Now, uh, Richard wanted to get to a question about the J Rod. Right. I need to ask you this. So we we've been talking about the J Rod and how it interacted with Dan and and uh, downloaded information to him. Is the J Rod still there at the facility, or what happened? No, to him? no. He, they they allowed him to go back home uh, in 2003. 
and through a certain portal uh, that was in the area of Egypt. I can't go into more detail now. Right. But uh, the Stargate, that's why my company is called Stargate, because uh, that's what I've been told, that we're all going to be going through these Stargates at some point or another. And the movie was based on pretty much a true thing, and we know how to open these Stargates. Wow. I want to get one other quick thing in here. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, I talked to some very high-level people in the Air Force and other insiders, and I said, well, what percentage of all these sightings are ours, and what percentage are theirs? And all three people who didn't know each other, they said it's about 70-plus percent are ours. Wow. Now, I would have never thought that. I thought it would be the opposite. Yeah. These people are very high-level so all, a lot of these sightings are our pilots, right. you know, flying around or whatever. And there's some other pilots, especially from Germany, and that's a whole other discussion about paper clips. Ron, right. hang on with us. Oh, we, we, uh, we, stay for another show. we have right. one final a commercial break. When we come back, are there dire messages that we should be paying attention to? And what does it have to do with any coming events in 2012? Be right back with Ron Garner. This gets me thinking. The, the, the one thing that, we, that we've heard from the Brookings Institution study, the famous clamp study, um, was this would cause a great uh, social upheaval. It would destroy our social bonds, our religious bonds. Every time uh, an individual is approached with the issue of would this destroy your faith, I have heard, it's my experience only, I'm sure there are going to be varied opinions, no, it would no, it would strengthen it, it would strengthen it. From a certain perspective, yes, from another perspective, no. The Brookings Institution was correct on a certain level. Suspend disbelief for a moment and, and walk with the idea that this is real, that the, the ruins that are present on the moon and on Mars, the ancient temples, we're in fact, and are in fact, the gifts of our own progeny. And we're back with Ron Garner. Ron, we just had a, a kind of a poignant clip there from Dan. What is going on in terms of the future? Is, is, did he learn something from the J-Rod that we need to be concerned about? Yes, it's something that uh, we need to be concerned about, but especially on a spiritual level. Because what Dan explained to me on my camera is that in 2012, our solar system passes through the plane of the, of the galactic plane. It's like a hobby horse. Uh, it's going up and down. And when it, it uh, passes that plane, it has something to do with, not radiation per se, but it has something to do with our spirituality. And we need to get more meditation. I meditate my whole life. And we need to, to develop our spirituality. If we don't, then some of us split off and become J-Rods, Another group splits off and becomes the Orions, which are the blonde, uh, blue-eyed ones that uh, a lot of people know about. And there's some subsets of those. But uh, the key element in 2012, and it's not 2012 on uh, December, it could be a little before that or it could be after that. Danny says that the, uh, that has been moved back to 2015 now. Hmm. And some other sources say it's 20-something. Uh, but I think 15, 16 is more of a critical time than 12, from my information. Huh. So but we need to get our act together spiritually. That's the key. That's what the J-Rod and what, what these other beings have told our secret government. We have to develop ourselves and love and peace and take care of each other. That's what it's all about. Right. We've been trying. Now, one question also, we were talking during the break about this, these secret uh, little countries within the bases. What, what is it about the guards? Yeah, the difference is that Area 51 proper is a military base, but 10 miles uh, southwest is S-4. That's where all the hot stuff, the super secret stuff, that's where... Dan Burrish was, that's where Bill Uhouse was, that's where, um, you know, the, the, all of the super secret things were. Yeah. Right. Now, 
that's the part that's a part, in my humble informed opinion is what they're talking about is a secret um, country on its own it has its own laws i think that there may even be an administrative building built into the mountain papoose mountain there where you have et sitting around watching computers oh jeez that, that, that's but I, that's kind of, so hard something. for the mind <laughs> no just that, that that reminds me of mib i mean it's probably sure, just like sure. that okay where would you like to see this go ron what can people do if uh, they're interested in this do you want to make a movie or what yeah, I want to make a feature film uh, saw on the par uh, with what uh, James Cameron's done, uh, and I think that, that this is something that can be done. I'm having a meeting with Jesse Ventura next week, and other people right. in Hollywood have this story at low levels. It hasn't been developed yet. Right. Well, but I, it, that's it's, the goal. It, it's going to be the biggest story in history. I mean, this is. I agree with you. you. Know, this I, is. I agree as well. And, uh, <laughs> this, I agree. Ron, uh, we need to say good night. Ron, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Good night, Ron. Being here. You're welcome. All Best right, of see luck. you around, my friend. When we come back, we'll tell you how to subscribe to our streaming video service. Stay with us. Okay, that's it for us tonight. Remember that uh, Matrix TV airs in the UK every Friday night at 7 p.m. on Edge and Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific on the America One television network. And, of course, you can watch Matrix TV every night at MatrixNewsNetwork.com. Hundreds of past episodes and special features are yours for just pennies a day, and it helps keep this show on the air. It really does. From Studio City, California, good night, everybody. We'll see you next week.